Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Michelle Yi from Emergency Medicine Cases, and this is part one of a rapid review of episode 77, Fever and the Returned Traveler. In the next six minutes, we're going to develop an approach to the history, physical, and investigations for fever and the return to traveler. We're going to learn about the highlights of typhoid and dengue fever. Then in part two of our rapid review, we're going to be reviewing the diagnosis and management of malaria. So let's get right into it. So when approaching this patient, you want to ask specifically about a couple of things. Pre-traveled preparation. Had they gone to a travel clinic? Did they get immunizations or malaria prophylaxis? What was their travel itinerary? Where did they go? Were they visiting friends or relatives? Did they have any specific exposures concerning foods, high-risk behaviors? Clarify about insect bites, animal exposures, or sick contacts. As usual, ask about host factors, past medical history, previous infections, diabetes, pregnancy, immunosuppression. While it seems obvious here, one of the most common errors is that emergency providers simply forget to ask about travel history. So, especially in vague presentations, if a patient presents with fever, always ask about travel. The differential diagnosis is going to change depending on what region they've traveled to and what time of the year. So, save yourself the headache and forget memorizing these things and just look it up. One great resource for information, the CDC Yellow Book or website. Next, do a head-to-toe physical. Some key things to consider, their vitals, their mental status. Look closely for skin lesions or things such as hepatosplenomegaly or lymphadenopathy. When investigating these patients, the emphasis is going to be generally on blood work, including CBC, lights, creatinine, bili, LFTs, and blood cultures. If the patient has just returned from a malaria endemic region, you need three negative thick and thin smears completed every 12 hours to rule out malaria. If dengue or typhoid is on your differential, consider serology. Your analysis and chest x-ray may also be relevant depending on how your patients present. But remember, these symptoms can absolutely be non-travel related. They can still have pneumonia, urosepsis, or any other type of illness. The reality is, fever in the returned traveler is usually not caused by a dangerous tropical disease. Now that we have an approach, let's get to the details of a couple tropical diseases. First up, typhoid fever. Typhoid fever is a bacterial illness transmitted through the fecal-oral route. It's often spread through contaminated food or water. The presentation of typhoid can vary incredibly, but here's where a couple historical clues can help. In typhoid fever, the heart rate can be a head turner because even with fever, their heart rate may sit in the 40s or 50s. But like many of the signs of typhoid fever, relative bradycardia, it's nonspecific and insensitive. Most patients you see with typhoid fever may suffer from diarrhea, but almost just as commonly, constipation can be seen. The classic rash we see with typhoid is rose spots on the trunk and extremities. It's present in about 40-50% to of patients with typhoid fever, but again, not always present. The most sensitive test for typhoid fever is the blood culture. You're looking for salmonella typhi, and in the preliminary, this comes back as a gram-negative bacilli. However, in the emergency department, the diagnosis is generally going to be based on our clinical suspicion. Next up. Dun, dun, dun. Dengue fever. Dengue is a viral hemorrhagic fever that's transmitted by mosquitoes. It carries a pretty high morbidity and mortality rate. There's a wide breadth of presentations with almost no pathognomonic signs, making this diagnosis really difficult. While dengue is often thought to be a bimodal saddleback fever, only some patients get this. To make the diagnosis of dengue, you need two things. One, fever, and two, two or more of the following. Rash, commonly seen as either petechiae or islands of white in a sea of red. Arthralgias, sometimes so severe and debilitating that dengue is also known as breakbone fever. 
you can get nausea, vomiting, leukopenia, or a positive tourniquet test, where distal petechiae can appear after deflating a blood pressure cuff that's been left inflated for five minutes. One similar disease to dengue is chikungunya. These are both acute febrile illnesses with headache, myalgias, and arthralgias that are associated with exposure to mosquitoes. When considering how to differentiate the two, recognize that dengue can lead to severe manifestations such as dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue shock syndrome. On the other hand, the arthralgias of chikungunya may lead to persistent arthralgias or even arthritis lasting for several months afterwards. Management of dengue fever is largely supportive, but monitor closely because patients with severe dengue may have significant hypotension and hemorrhage, requiring fluid support, blood products, and sometimes even ICU admission. So that's a wrap. Remember to always ask about travel, have a structured approach, and consider typhoid and dengue, which can present with nonspecific symptoms. Tune into part two of this rapid review to learn about the clinical presentation, diagnosis, and management of malaria. For full references and a written summary, visit the EM Cases website.